accent. Um, thank you so much for giving up some of your time today to talk to me. Um, I couldn't believe it yesterday when I put out a question to some of my followers on the on the titty gritty. Um, I, I put out, you know, has anybody got issues or questions with regards to t returning to work um, after cancer? Because I thought, oh, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me that found it hard. Well, in, in about 10 minutes, I had 52 or 54 questions coming in saying, can you ask this? Can you ask that? Um, so I hugely appreciate your time. Um, I genuinely thought that this was just me. It's obviously not. Um, so from my point of view, when I um, went through treatment, I was really lucky because my employer, um, they, they paid me and then I had sick pay and my return to work was great. I was able to do a phase return and uh, I felt that actually, I felt quite supported and, and they asked me questions a lot, which was brilliant. But it yeah. turns out not everybody goes through that same um, experience. Um, so can I ask how, first of all, so you um, run and have created Working With Cancer. What is that? What, what is Working With Cancer? Okay, so we're a, what's called a social enterprise. Uh, uh, basically, we're all of us cancer survivors, sorry, terrible phrase, um, people who've had cancer and still alive. Um, <laughs> um, and a couple of people who were carers. Um, and I set it up, I, I originally had cancer in 2005, I had breast cancer. Uh, I was working as HR director uh, at a big investment management company in the city. And I found it, you know, even in a really quite a senior position, I found it really tough returning to work. I had a whole number of problems. It was lovely while I was at home, you know, I was bombarded with flowers and hampers and all the kind of lovely things. And then as soon as I got back, there was a kind of, uh, why, why are you here? And, you know, um, we weren't expecting you to come back because in those days, people did not go back to work very much mm -hmm. after cancer, you know, largely because in those days, treatments weren't as good, but it was also expected that you would, um, quotes tick off things on your bucket list mm -hmm. um spend more time with your family yeah, <laughs> yeah. um and uh so i i kind of got involved a little bit after that with a, i set up a little campaigning group to support to just to provide actually information like your rights and what a good employer should do and then i got working a bit with macmillan who at that stage didn't have any kind of information around work and cancer. I did a bit of work with the Department of Health on their, or quite a lot on the, what was called the National Cancer Survivorship Initiative. But then when I retired in, allegedly retired, <laughs> who retires these days? Who retired, um, yeah. In 2012, it just struck me that there was a huge amount of work I could kind of do in this area. But I, this wasn't something I didn't sort of finish breast cancer treatment and then say I'm going to set up working with cancer. This was a really slow burn, you know, and, and the one thing I would say to anybody is that, you know, particularly when you're just after treatment, don't rush your fences into trying to do something different. If you're if you want to do something else, give yourself time to settle, settle down and think about what's what's right for you. Um, but just to explain what a social enterprise is. So what we do is we work with big companies and small companies and medium sized companies. Um, uh, and the, we provide coaching and support to people returning to work after cancer. And, and people pay for that service, they pay a relatively commercial rate, but we use that money to give free or subsidized support to people who don't have uh, employer support, or who can't, you know, who are on benefits. So we do a lot of free coaching. And during the pandemic, um, we gave a lot of free support to doctors uh, mm -hmm. via our wonderful ambassador, Liz O'Rourden. So, yeah. I know Liz. I yeah, know Liz. terrific. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's just an incredible setup and there's, you know, such a need for it. Um, so can I start with what, what are our rights? Say we're in full-time employment and we have a cancer diagnosis, we have to take time off. 
presumably we are allowed to take that time off to have the yes. treatment. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's a piece of legislation called the Equality Act 2010, which is um, a really terrific piece of law and it protects people like you and me and anyone who's had cancer from uh, discrimination at work from the point of actually interview right through to references so you know that includes recruitment training development promotion anything um, it protects you from discrimination directly or indirectly um, for the rest of our lives okay so i am still protected you are still protected so for example um if uh, you weren't selected for a job because of your cancer that is uh, discrimination if you were not allowed to go on a training course or you weren't promoted because your boss says you know look like helen you're a really terrific person but we don't think we think it's going to be too much for you to do mm. the kind of job at the next grade up you know we're, we're being, that that kind of wonderful kindness you know yeah. um, uh, we don't think it's right for you at this stage because it's going to make you really tired. Yeah, that kind of, mm -hmm. that is called indirect discrimination. And um, were you, uh, I mean, not many people do this, but were you to go to a tribunal, um, you would be entitled to what's called an uncapped award. So it's, you know, it's not that it's capped at a certain amount of money. Mm. So uh, some of the penalties for discrimination can be, you know, very, very high. And there's a lot of reputational damage. Now, the issue is, is that people don't know that they're entitled to these rights. And very often an employer doesn't know. Mm. I, 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 you know, very often, like in a big organization, the group HR department, human resources department, they may know that, but the line manager on the ground may have no idea. Okay. Mm. So he might, well, or she might say, well, you can't go to that medical appointment or you can't do this where well, you can. And that just leads me to the second really important part of the legislation is you're entitled to what are called reasonable adjustments. Mm -hmm. So that's anything from a phased return to work, which can be not just like six weeks or eight weeks. We're talking about it can be for many months. Mm -hmm. Uh, through to being able to attend medical appointments, mm -hmm. um, working flexible hours, working from home. Obviously, we're COVID, we're all doing that. Pretty mm -hmm. much all of us are doing that these days. Um, mm -hmm. So lots of different adjustments you can have to make your job, make your return to work easier. And one of the questions that I had actually was was connected to that, that, that this person is on a, on a phased return, which was welcomed. Um, but what happens if at the end of that phase to return, they feel like I'm just, just still not ready. I'm not quite there yet. Um, so it depends how long the phase return is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Unfortunately, many organizations have a policy where they have a standard phase return to work, which is kind of 12 weeks after which you're expected to be quotes back to normal. Okay. Mm -hmm. We never get back to normal as I'm sure you know Helen you know it's, mm. that, that's not possible um, so you know normally you can have a phased return to work for say normally you should be able to have that as a right for well over a year mm. and if it's not still working out if you're having real difficulties then you could request as a permanent adjustment to your job that you continue to work on a you know not on a full-time basis and that that request would have to be properly considered it, it's such a it's such a difficult thing to um sort of navigate isn't it because yeah. like for example, if i take myself for example i wanted to go back i still wanted to be career driven and considered for certain things but equally you're you're never the same again so your priorities are slightly different so i'm very apprehensive now with going for different roles because i'm thinking oh, I don't know if I want to be a new person in a, again in a, in a new role, whereas I know what I'm doing and that's like my safety blanket. Um, so there is an element of you need to own your, you know, what you feel is right for you as well. Yeah, isn't there? yeah. and that's where actually was a small advert for our coaching. That's where we really kind of work very successfully with people. It's helping them cope with the changes that have gone on to them both physically and 
emotionally because I think the one thing that's really underestimated is the psychological trauma of cancer. Um, oh, absolutely. It, it, and, and it's, you know, it's a, I think sometimes the psychological impact of cancer is greater than the physical impact and, and deeply underestimated. So the, the classic one is just the fear of the cancer coming back. I, mean, I don't know about you, Helen, but no. every ache or pain I ever have, it's like, oh God, it's come back. You yeah, know? absolutely. Um, yeah, so you immediately catastrophize. Um, but I think, you know, it, it is difficult navigating, but it's navigating your way back. But actually, it's perfectly possible. And one of the classic issues, again, with cancer treatment is loss of confidence and anxiety about, can I still do the job? Mm -hmm. And frankly, most people, you know, I mean, everyone's cancer is different and we're all different people. But most people can lead extremely successful working lives, possibly more successful than before. It's just being given the tools and resources and the confidence and, to use another jargon word, the empowerment to kind of make those decisions and, and move forward. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, even those with metastatic advanced cancer, uh, uh, can a they can live for many years with advanced disease, and b they can lead amazingly successful working lives for five, ten years or more. How different are your rights if you are living with cancer? Because that was a question that I had a lot. They're not any different. <laughs> They're the same. Uh, if you're a carer, it's different. Right. Uh, you, still have, you still have rights as a carer. Yeah against being discriminated against directly because you're a carer. But presumably... But take you, Helen. Yeah. So if we take you, let's say you apply for a, a job somewhere uh, and you're and you're appointed. You don't have to disclose your cancer, by the way. There's no requirement to do that. But you have the same rights now mm -hmm. and you'd have the same rights in 10 years mm -hmm. as you would have had had you been having cancer treatment. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. That makes sense. So, yeah. So, for example, if you have a medical appointment mm. in, you know, in, in next month, you're perfectly well, um, but it's just your regular checkup. Yeah. You have a right to go to that appointment and not to have your employer say you can't go to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, if you are, but if you're living with cancer and you have to have regular treatment you know you're, you're going to need you're relaxed, you're still having yeah um again there will that come because because i presume you like you would get sick pay for those days potentially but at, at some point sick pay has to run out doesn't it it depends. Um, it, it, different employers do different things. You're quite right. So people who, for example, are having Herceptin infusions or just having immunotherapy treatments, you know, some employers will pay sick pay. Some people have uh, insurance, will, will, mm -hmm. will, will have an insurance program to support. Others don't. And, you know, there, there may be benefits that people can claim if they've run out of sick pay. It's always worth checking that out. They're... they're I'm not the most up-to-date person on benefits, but there was something called the Employment Support Allowance, which yeah. sometimes covered people who'd run out of sick pay. Where would they go to look for that, would you say, on the government website and have a look at that? Government way? website or ring the, uh, the Macmillan or the, the Maggie's oh. uh, benefits, benefits helplines. They're very good. Uh, right, OK, that's a really good piece of advice. The other question that I had a lot was... it. it, it very much um, seen that if you work for a big organisation, you tended to be more looked after in terms of sort of financially and support. But what about if you're working for a really small company where there's not that many employees? Are your rights the same? Yes, <laughs> basically, they're exactly the same, right. even if the organisation has only one person, okay? And, and your so your rights and your rights begin from day one of as it were employment as or you in, in some cases under case law you know at the interview stage mm -hmm. I mean clearly a di an organization may find it more difficult to make the adjustments you're asking for and that often happens at for example 
small GP practices or in in smaller schools where you know there is a, an issue with staff you know any issue with staffing but those rights still obtain and the one thing we have found is sometimes smaller organizations know their people better mm. and are actually more willing to go the extra mile to support someone mm. also because they need them there yeah, as it was yes. um than the big ones what? so it's, it's not always the case that small organizations don't treat people as well um, um what is the situation say you've joined a small organization but you've only been there a matter of four weeks and then you get your diagnosis Again, you're still it's still the same absolutely from from literally from day one you're protected what if the employer makes it difficult for you though i did have these questions where they were like yeah. can you on the days you're not having chemo we need you to work you can work remotely but we need you to work yeah um uh that's something that a lot of you know a lot certainly employ organizations do um it's actually uh it could be it could be described as harassment um the, the issue is is that very often people don't want to make a fuss no. because they're concerned that they're going to be made you know they're going to be made redundant or they're gonna you know, have a really tough time at work or they'll be sacked of course which would be illegal and people don't want to take their employers to, to court. You know, A, it takes forever these days mm. uh, because of COVID, and B, the amount of energy, you know, mm. mental energy, emotional energy it takes is enormous. Mm. But you still have rights. And I think it's important that people understand they have rights mm. and make it clear to their employer that they are allowed to exercise those rights. The, the pro, you know, and, and, and I, it's always a fine line. You know, some employers may well go about sack somebody, and you, and life is too complicated to make a fuss. Mm. You know? mm. But you know, all I can say to people is, you know, understand your rights and make it clear to your employer what they are, because very often they do not realise they're in breach of the law. Mm. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no. There are some evil employers, Helen, you know, I know, I know. there are some really evil people out there, but we do find on many occasions that they just don't actually know what their responsibilities are. But also, I can see it from the small organisation's point of view, that if they can't financially operate without that person, they're in a really difficult position and it's Absolutely. not their fault either. No. <laughs> Presumably, they would be able to apply for something to help support them while, whilst an employee is off. I don't know. I'm not sure they they are, to be frank. But again, I'm not an expert. But I think, you know, very often there, there also can be accommodations that can be made without an awful lot of pain and trauma. It just needs mm -hmm. a bit of imagination. So, for example, if an employer is requiring somebody to travel in to work, and uh, they don't want to go on public transport because their immune system's crashed. But they're probably saying, well, can you just do a few hours? There's a great organization called Access to Work, which is a government body, mm. which funds taxes mm. and other means of support for people. So there are bodies like that. You know, mm. Access to Work is a particular example, mm. which can support small organizations who would find it difficult to fund um supporting someone mm. so it'd be, it would certainly be worth for a small organization seeing whether they would fund for example cover i'm, I'm not sure that they do but um, it's worth, it ask, it's worth yeah. asking those questions isn't it and exactly. if anybody's watching this and wants to know more information on something how do they contact you um they contact us uh, basically through uh, our website um or they can, and on the web website there are our, you know, contact details, phone numbers, whatever. And you know, we we try and get back to everybody, uh, certainly on the day, and no longer than forty eight hours. So, um, and it's yeah. working with cancer. Um, yeah, just, yeah, working and with a capital W for the with. Oh, there you go. Um, I'm just checking my um, other notes. 
What about things like, um, you know, we were talking earlier about how the mental impact is often harder than the, the physical. There yeah. are some people that message me saying, I can, phys I can physically travel now, I think, but the anxiety that, I've, that, they, that they're dealing with, it's almost a bit like PTSD, I should imagine, after being through that. Um, what can they do? do they, what is the first thing that you do in that situation where you think, I can't cope? Is it you speak to your line manager? Do they come to somebody like you first? Like what, what would the rule of thumb be? Um, I think it's always useful to get some support, like either counselling or, you know, approach us for our coaching. Um, I think it's always important to talk to your manager about the fact you've had a cancer. If, you're, if you've got real anxiety, if it started while you've been at the company, as it were, they, frankly, they should know about your cancer. But it's, it's important bringing um, your employer up to speed with what's going on. Um, we've got some, um, again, a small, a small lab, but we've got some really good best practice guides on our website and our resources page. And that kind of leads people from, as it were, the point of diagnosis right through the end of treatment about how you have conversations with your employer, what you say, how you deal with things like uh, you know the physical impact but also anxiety and loss of confidence oh that, those, that, we have those guides we have them for not only people with cancer yeah. but for the employer and for carers and for colleagues oh really okay yeah. that's a great resource to have yeah yeah we developed them in just well we developed them about a couple of years ago put them on the website last year and they've been really popular so yeah. definitely you know people go and download download them but i think um, there are there are other things you can do. Sometimes people find mindfulness type courses very very useful. Um, I think that sometimes it's also people just worth understanding that anxiety, loss of confidence, you know, depression are all kind of normal. Sounds awful, but normal side effects yeah. from cancer. And you're not going mad if you feel that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. It's, it's if, if anything, it's quite nice to hear you say those words because it almost gives everybody a bit of permission. And a, like I, when you say that, my, I feel my shoulders going, oh, like I'm not going mad. No, it's completely normal. And lots of people, you know, go through it and there's help out there. I think that that's what's really important. And it's really reassuring to know that. Yeah, there's a really good article by a clinical psychologist called uh, uh, Dr. Peter Harvey. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, you can get it from our, our website or the web. And it's called After the Treatment Finishes, Then What? Okay. And it is a brilliant, uh, it's a few pages long, but a brilliant description of the challenges that... 99.9% .9 of people who've had cancer face when they're recovering from cancer. I'm going to look that up. Yeah, oh, I would absolutely recommend it to anybody. Yeah, I'm going to look that up. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for your time this morning for answering. Oh, that was my front door. <laughs> so typical. <laughs> Uh, Barbara, thank you so much for your time and for all your information and advice. And if anybody uh, watching wants any more information, then it's workingwithcancer.com. Yeah. .co .uk. uk. And I'll also make sure that I put this in the description as well. So if anybody wants to contact uh, Barbara's team, then um, I'll, all the details will be there. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoy your day. I will. <laughs> All the best. <laughs>